Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Bedtime Stories with Miss Byrne. Now, we left off um, with some kind of startling news. Maybe not news, I don't know, but Clementine, remember, overheard her parents talking about something that they have one left and they only need one, and she's very worried. She thinks they're going to get rid of her. I hope they don't. So let's see what happens. This is chapter eight of Clementine. Here is a secret good thing. Sometimes I like journal writing at school because I can remind myself of things I might forget when I'm a grown up, like that I plan to smoke cigars and I do not plan to get married. Cigars, yes, husband, no. What if I forget these things? <laughs> One more thing to remember when I'm old, if I ever do get married, which I will not, I will only have one kid, the first one. She is plenty good enough, even if she's the hard one. Nope, no need for another kid, even if he's the easy one. Although thinking about my brother and thinking about my journal gave me an astonishing idea on Saturday. Last week, Turnip had to get a shot at the doctor's and he was so mad about it my parents let him rent a video and eat gummy worms even though they are usually the Sesame Street and carrot sticks kind of parents. So I pretended I had to write in my journal even though I didn't because it was the, it was the weekend. And I pretended I was mad about it so my parents would feel sorry for me too. As soon as they came into the room, I scringed my eyebrows down like arrows and stuck my bottom teeth out as far as they could go. Here is a picture of that. <laughs> if my teeth were pointier, I would have looked fierce, like our stone lion. Still, see how mad I looked? But guess what my parents did? Nothing, because they are not so good at paying attention. Excuse me, I said. I am very mad about this journal. May I please have some gummy worms and a video? They stared at me like I had spoken in a secret language Margaret and I use, which I was almost sure I had not. You let Zucchini have gummy worms and a video when he was mad about his shot, I reminded them. First of all, my mother said, your brother's name isn't Zucchini. Second of all, he's three years old. And third of all, my father said, considering all the trouble you got into this week, I don't think it's quite the time for special treats, do you? Okay, fine, I said, but it wasn't. In the afternoon, my mom had to go to her yoga class and my brother had to go to his Saturday play group. My dad was around, but he was up on the second floor taking care of a plumbing issue. Usually on Saturday afternoons, Margaret and I play together, but now Margaret was not my friend anymore. So I had nothing to do, not even eat gummy worms and watch a video for three whole hours until I could go back to get the big polka picture. Then I realized I didn't exactly know where I should put the picture once I got it. What I needed was one of the top windows right in the middle of the building where it would scare off the pigeons. Margaret's apartment was on the fifth floor, but I don't think Margaret's mother was about to let a common criminal use her window. The man who lives on the sixth floor smells like mothballs, so I never visit him. The people who live on the seventh floor were away on vacation while their apartment got painted, which reminded me. I flew up to the seventh floor to see if the painters wanted help yet. Nobody answered the apartment door when I knocked but the painter's stilts and all their brushes and paint cans were out in the hall. The hall hadn't been painted yet, which gave me a great idea. I could do it for them. Then when they got back on Monday, they'd smack their foreheads and make, wow, I must be dreaming faces. They'd wondered, they'd wonder who had done such a great thing until I went up and told them, oh, it was just me. This sounds like a bad idea. I was smiling about all this while I strapped the stilts onto my legs. But when I tried to stand up, I fell right over. I tried again, and I fell right over again. 
29 times, which was plenty, I believe. Which was plenty, believe me. So I was all done being there. On the way down, the elevator stopped at the fifth floor. I got a little bit excited when Margaret got in and smiled at me. But then one second later, that Amanda Lee got in too. Hi, Clementine. We're going to the mall, Margaret said. I turned around and pretended to be very busy pushing all the buttons until they got off. Then I went to my room and drew, picture, drew a picture of me at the mall with a lot of new best friends. Finally, it was time to go to the coffee shop. And I ran all the way, even though I probably had two broken legs from all that falling. Here's on the still. I'm glad she didn't follow through with trying to paint. <laughs> when the clerk brought out the picture of Polka Dotty, my heart hurt so much I couldn't breathe for a minute. She looked so beautiful that big. She looked so beautiful that big, and I missed her so much. I quick sucked in some air so I wouldn't faint, and then I said, thank you, and took Polka home, being careful not to fold her, because she would have hated that. When I got to my building, I looked up through all the pigeons. At the very top of the building was old Mrs. Jacoby's apartment. I tucked the big picture of Polka under my arm, took the elevator to the eighth floor, and knocked on Mrs. Jacoby's door. Can I put this on your window? I asked. The one in the middle of your living, living room? Mrs. Jacoby said, Why certainly, dearie, without even asking why. And suddenly, she didn't look so old or so boring. I went to the window and opened it. When I looked down, I could see the backs of a million cooing pigeons. They covered every windowsill, every balcony, every ledge, every brick that stuck out even an inch. In between, I could see the sidewalk in front of the building, still wet from my dad's washing. I guess this was what my dad meant about seeing things from a different angle, but I didn't understand how it could help. Mrs. Jacoby came over beside me and shook half a box of Cheerios onto the windowsill. The pigeons flapped up in one huge gray cloud, and my brain snapped. Hey! Hey! I ran out of Mrs. Jacoby's apartment and all the way down to my own, 8 times 12 stairs, which equals 96. Dad! I yelled. What if the pigeons lived on the side of the building instead of in the front? Would that be okay? That would be great, my dad said. A miracle. Except, of course, first you'd have to convince a million pigeons to move. But if I could, would that solve the problem? You wouldn't care if they messed all over the sidewalk in the side alley? Nope, not a bit. Nobody uses it. That alley could be knee-deep in pigeon splat, and nobody would even notice. Fire away, I'd say. And then I ran all the way back up to the stairs to Mrs. Jacoby's apartment and went right inside since the door was still open because that's how fast I was. I'll run for your Cheerios every week, I told her. You won't even have to ask me. Every day if you want. But will you stop feeding the pigeons from here? Will you feed them from a side window instead? So that is why the pigeons are living on their building. Mrs. Jacoby's been feeding them Cheerios. I took her into the dining room and showed her a perfect place. Let's start today, I said, and I sprinkled out the rest of the box of Cheerios. And even though pigeons have teeny tiny bird brains, they got the message pretty quick because right away a big flock of them flapped over. And it was even better for Mrs. Jacoby because this was her dining room. So now she could see those pigeons eating when she was eating. And then I was all done being there, so I ran back home to tell my dad the good news. He and my mom were in the kitchen starting dinner, so I told them, and I told them, and I told them. And my dad kept saying, way to go, sport! And my mom kept saying, thank goodness, now you don't have to spend your life cleaning up after those pigeons. They were so happy. But my parents were sneaky, too. Somehow, while I was telling them about Mrs. Jacoby, one of them slipped me a colander of green beans and brainwashed me into snapping them. Sneaky parents. I didn't really care, though. 
Seeing the, wow, I must be dreaming faces on my parents was even better than it would have been seeing them on the painters. Unfortunately, they didn't have those faces very long. After dinner, my mother said she'd better get a little work done. Then she went to the cupboard to get her special markers, which were still in Margaret's room. You used my, not the permanent. Those are for, what were you? It's a very bad sign when my mother can't finish her sentences. They're at Margaret's, I told her. They're fine, not even chewed on. I'll go get them. Oh no, said my father, we'll go get them. I think it's time we had a talk with Margaret's mother anyway. You'll go sit in your room and think about things. So I went to my room and thought about things, like Margaret's mother explaining to my parents about the easy one, hard one rule. Uh-oh. Clementine is now even more worried and in trouble. <laughs> Not good. So that is the end of chapter eight. Mom just found out that the per marker on her head is permanent. And mom is not happy by the looks of the picture on the next page, which I won't show you until tomorrow night. All right, so I'll see you then for chapter nine. Bye.